So, I want you to take a moment and think about, this is a room full of leaders. Who do you think would be the most important person for us to work with? Shout it out. Think of a, think of a C-level executive. Who do you think we would have the most important person to work with? HR. There we go. We have a winner. The chief people officer. Now, guess what? We were actually able to get Christian, Christian Major, the EVP, and chief people officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprises to take time out of her day to come and speak to us. So with that, I'd like you to join me in giving her a warm round of applause and welcoming her up to the High Tech Famia. <laughs> You're welcome. You. Well, that is a very nice introduction. I should come over more often. <laughs> this is great. So hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for inviting me to come over from our headquarters, which I think you all visited yesterday. So um, on behalf of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, on behalf of our CEO, Antonio Neri, and behalf of myself and the entire executive team, I want to say thank you for everything you're doing, and welcome to Houston, and welcome to our part of Northeast Houston here. So um, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, diversity, inclusion, and equality are central to who we are. It's our mission. Um, I have had the great privilege of working for HP and then HPE for the last almost 13 years. I have kind of an interesting story. I'm actually a lawyer. Uh, I was an employment lawyer for many years. I worked at a big law firm out of New York, and I came to HP to be an in-house counsel in 2011. Um, when we had many more employees than we do now, we were big HP, and we had 330,000 employees all over the world, and it was truly one of the most eye-opening global experiences I had ever had. Um, about five years ago, I moved into the HR world. I had always had HR as my client, but I moved in and uh, worked with our Aruba group, so networking, and ran HR for that group, which was amazing. Um, a terrific job. I was telling my new friend Carlos over here that that was one of the best HR jobs I've ever had. Um, and then three months ago, uh, I was promoted from chief talent officer to chief people officer when my former boss, Alan May, retired. So um, it's been an exciting adventure. But one of the things I am most proud of and which grounds me every day in what we do with Hewlett Packard Enterprise is we are truly advancing the way people live and work. And part of that is through sponsoring programs like this and conferences where everybody can get together and share ideas. So it is truly who we are, and we are so proud to be here. So I'm going to now introduce um, Carlos Beltre, my new friend from JPMC. <laughs> As I mentioned, um, before becoming the Chief People Officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I had the great fortune to be the Chief Talent Officer. And now, my very good friend, Dan Dominich, is also the, chief, is the new Chief Talent Officer, and he'll be coming up as well to have a conversation with Carlos about some very important topics. And in HR, I like to think that we are truly part of the solution here in opening doors and making all companies, but in, for me, HPE, a great place to work for everyone. So with that, I'm going to welcome these two to the stage. And thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for everything you are doing for this amazing community. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, buen provecho. Um, I know that this is going to be a different type of session as you eat and we talk. But this is just like in La Cocina de Tu Mamá. Vamos a tener una conversación abierta. We're going to have an open conversation, like in your mom's kitchen, in which we're going to talk about many several things, including diversity, equity, inclusion. But we're going to be talking about the importance of um, building a pipeline of executive leaders that are Hispanic in technology. My name is Carlos Beltre from J.B. Morgan Chase. I am the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion in global technology, where um, we service over 60,000 employees globally. And I also am the leader of Tech for Social Good, which is an organization in which we connect nonprofits and our software engineers and do pro bono work for them, um, helping them continue to advance and have an impact in the communities that they're in. Um, I am of Dominican descent, 
and i um, really proud to be here um, today. And it's a great honor for me to introduce Dan, um, who actually is the um, Chief Talent Officer here at HPE, Dan Dominic. He, um, as CTO, he oversees talent acquisition, um, strategic workforce planning, people analytics, learning and development, succession management and performance management for the HPE, over 60,000 employees and team member organization. Before um, joining um, and in this role, he owned HR strategy and delivery for HP services organization, partnering with the president to drive business transformation, talent management, culture, and DEI. Dan has experience in industrial manufacturing, healthcare, financial services, and information technology in various roles in HR. So would you please help me welcome um, Dan to the stage as well today. Thank you, Michael. So Dan and I, we already have a lot of things in common. We were both born in Queens. Yes, yes. We then moved to Long Island. That's right. Uh, but I stayed in Long Island and then went to uh, New Jersey. I did. Uh, but we're looking forward to having this um, great conversation. And in the next few minutes, we're going to discuss um, how the landscape is changing, right, in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we're going to talk about what our role is as senior leaders in this space. We want to gain some insights into what is happening even here at HPE, how you guys are focused on it. We're going to learn a little bit about Dan's background and trajectory. Um, so we want you to get ready to ask questions and engage in this conversation, uh, which is um, very timely with everything that's going on in the landscape here in the United States as well. But uh, before we jump into that, we want to get to know Dan a little bit more so we have some rapid fire questions for him. So, Sounds great. Number one. Uh, then, are you an early riser or night owl? Definitely an early riser. I was up at 5.30 uh, this morning. I got my uh, meditation, uh, you know, daily devotion in, my workout in, so definitely an early riser. Awesome. Um, what is your favorite childhood cartoon? Tom and Jerry, for sure. Awesome. Tom and Jerry. I thought you were going to say Kalimang or something like that. Um, uh, what is, um, are you an introvert or an extrovert? I'm definitely an extrovert, although Myers-Briggs would tell you over time your style doesn't change, but I've definitely moved more toward the middle throughout my career, which is interesting. Okay. What do you prefer? Do you prefer to read books or listen to podcasts? You know, I love podcasts, but I mentioned my daily devotion. I love to crack open my Bible first thing every morning, so I have to say books. Both. Okay, books. Um, and lastly, if you had a superpower, what would it be? It would definitely be flying. Carlos, I uh, was a fan of uh, Superman when I was a kid, aging myself, the Christopher, Christopher Reeves Superman, so that would be my superpower. Awesome. <laughs> and I, I, if I ask my kids their favorite superhero, it would definitely be Batman, so at home we have this debate about Superman and Batman all the time. Um, now, we learned a little bit about yourself, but what's something that perhaps I didn't ask you about your career, your profession, or personally that you would like to share with us today? Yeah, well, before I answer that question, I want to acknowledge Asian Heritage Munch, uh, month, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, and Military Appreciation Month. So if any of you have served or have supported people that have served, thank you from the bottom of my heart. So I started my check-in uh, earlier today, right? You know who I am, uh, who I work for, what my job is. I didn't mention, but you did, thank you. I reside in New Jersey, was born in Queens. And one of the things we do at uh, HPE that we love is to share our personal identity statements. So I'll give you a little bit of mine. Uh, I consider myself a, a Christian uh, Latino male. Uh, I am Cuban American. I am married uh, to my wife, Nikki, this July 2nd, 30 years. We were obviously married at 12 years old. Why are you laughing, Carlos? Why are you laughing? <laughs> Uh, I have uh, five beautiful children. Uh, my oldest, uh, Daniela, was adopted from Peru. We had two biological children, and then we adopted my youngest uh, two from Guatemala. Uh, so I mentioned my faith. I'm very involved in my church. I'm an elder. I teach adult education, involved with youth ministry. And I'm blessed that every other year uh, we lead a mission trip to Guatemala. So uh, my kids get to go back to their homeland, and we get to build houses and give out shoes and uh, toothpaste and, uh, and do some, some neat things, so, so I'm very blessed. You know, one of the things that I wanted to share about my career that maybe isn't obvious from the bio is like our um, heritage, like our styles sometimes, 
you know, my faith wasn't always appreciated. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely um, needed to think about what it meant to be true to who you are, right? Uh, there were some people that, um, you know, didn't, uh, didn't enjoy the fact that I had that faith. And I, you know, I really realized that I need to be myself. Uh, I need to uh, power through some of those challenges uh, and be who I need to be versus what people may have been telling me to be. So, you know, I think one of the takeaways I have for, for you is be true to who you are and be an inspiration to your customers and your teams in terms of who you are. Awesome. Thank you, Dan, for sharing that. And the truth is, one of, one of our uh, core values at our, um, our bank is having courage. Um, and I think it takes courage to show up to work every single day with your full self and creating the environment, not just for yourself, but for others, to truly be yourself. And that's part of being inclusive, right? And it's really important. So thank you for having the courage of sharing that. Well, and you know, one of the practices uh, I've tried to do to, to encourage that is, um, I believe in re relational mindsets. And relational mindset means, as a team, uh, you try to build Ill intimacy as a team, such that you feel like you have each other's backs. And when you feel like you have each other's backs, you tend to not only celebrate together as a team, but give each other uh, more honest and candid feedback such that you can perform as a higher performing team. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in doing that, it was, uh, I know we have some friends from Google here. Uh, have any of you seen what the number one characteristic of high performing teams are these days? Anyone want to take a guess? Thank you. Uh, psychological safety is the number one characteristic. So it's so important that we build that with our teams. And one simple method that I've used is uh, personal and professional check-ins, you know, before we start every staff meeting. Um, when I took this role from Kristen, and again, I'm so thankful for Kristen's support, uh, we had a face-to-face -face for two days where the team would be updating me for, on the business, you know, for, for that entire time. But we spent our first hour with personal check-ins. Took a little bit of a risk, didn't know if everyone would be comfortable. And at the end of the time, uh, the team gave me some great feedback. They said, Dan, if we hadn't done that, I don't know that we would have been able to talk not only about what's going well, but what some of the challenges and opportunities are. So that's part of how we try to do it at HP. And one of our goals this afternoon as we talk to all of you is to not narrow down diversity, equity, inclusion to just numbers. Um, it is about creating the right culture, the right environment, the right setting. Um, and as you continue to grow in your career, you set the tone, right, of how you want to create and build that psychological safety as well. All right, then let's go back in time a little bit and tell us a little bit about early on in your career. What was your journey like growing up in corporate America and especially reaching to your goals and, and being an executive in the corporate world? Well, you know, hopefully uh, I'll touch on every sponsor here because I've worked in, I've been blessed to work in many different industries, many different companies. Uh, I started my career with GE on their HR development program, and I was talking with some folks at lunch today about the importance of rotating, right, through different types of roles and disciplines, and so that was uh, a blessing. Uh, I spent about 10 years in industrial manufacturing before moving to healthcare, uh, perhaps most notably with one of our sponsors, Johnson & Johnson. And J&J &J taught me uh, a model that uh, perhaps you all don't use anymore, but I never forgot it. It was called the PI model for progression. And uh, the PI model standed for performance, image, and exposure. And what it said was 10% of career progression is performance. Now, some of you might be falling out of your chair saying, wait a minute, Dan, it should be all performance. The thing is, if you're going to be progressing, it's a given that you're performing at a high level. So that's only really 10% of it. 35% is image. Now, you know, every company has a certain image they want to see that isn't always the image we portray, right, as uh, Hispanics. But what's great about working certainly at HPE is that the image we look for is people who live our values, right? People who believe in accelerating what's next. Uh, making bold moves, uh, believing in the power of yes, we can, being a force for good, yes. right? So it's those kinds of images we need to see from people that we want to progress. And the last piece of the model, exposure, and we talked about this in the board readiness program a lot yesterday, 55% is exposure. And it's uh, not necessarily who you know, but who knows you. Mm -hmm. 
right? So are we doing the networking? Are we meeting the people we need to uh, to be able to progress? So anyway, I thank uh, Jay and Jay for having taught me that as part of the Men of Color program I went through there. From there, I got exposure in uh, financial services with American Express uh, in information technology with uh, Dun & Bradstreet. And uh, it was that background that allowed me to, to come to HPE, initially leading HR uh, for their financial services organization, then the broader service uh, company, and, and now in the chief talent officer role. But one of the things I subscribe to, and hopefully you all do as well, <clears throat> is the 70-2010 model of development. You know, and 70%, and I believe, of development truly is on the job. It's um, raising your hand to take on more. It's taking on projects that make you uncomfortable. Right at HPE, we talk about being comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, so that's critical. 20%, right, the sponsorship, coaching, mentoring, and I'll talk more about that a little in a few minutes. Uh, but I've always aspired to understand who are the people in the company willing to put their reputation on the line to sponsor me for new opportunities, you know? Uh, who are people that I can get mentoring from every month, internally and externally to the company? And, um, you know, uh, who are coaches that can help me with some, you know, performance opportunities that I might have? So that's the 20% I've always gone after. And then 10%, you know, sometimes we think it's more than that, but you know, opportunities like this and, and webinars and, and classroom training, that's really important, but it's really maybe 10% of our development. So I've, I'm always uh, trying to be learning agile. Carlos, always trying to grow. I can't read enough from you guys at Gartner or I4CP or Deloitte or Accenture, uh, always trying to learn and develop. That's awesome. So definitely seeing throughout your career that growth mindset, right? Of Absolutely. just continuously learning, continuously improvement and developing, which is really creating critical in our careers if we want to get to that executive level. And even when we get there, it has to be continuous as well. Yeah, and so many of us, right, are mentoring and coaching others. And so I think about when I was at GE, uh, the program manager for the HR development program, he believed, he saw things in me that I didn't see in myself, Carlos. You know, he told me I was going to be an executive in the next 10 years or whatever it was. And, Having that kind of confidence was game changing for me. And, and how can we do that, right? We talk about pulling up, uh, pushing up and pulling up. How, who, who are we pulling up and giving that confidence to when we see things in them that they don't see in themselves? Yeah, absolutely. And I know that a lot of times we're so focused on like the promotion, like how do I get that next promotion? And when I mentor a lot of people, even whether they're junior, middle, or in their career, there's a lot of focus on what do I need to get promoted? And I say, put that to a side sometimes and just think about how do you progress in your career? How do you continue to grow every single day, in every way, or like personally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but even professionally as well? And the promotions lead on. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that because you talked about exposure. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. Uh, but it's so important to have that growth mindset and just always evolve and always grow. Now, let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've seen the headlines um, after last summer and some of the rulings from the um, Supreme Court, and, um, and we've seen a lot of different organizations either back down from some of their diversity initiatives and efforts. Um, in our conversation, we had some, some great talks about the great work that you're doing here. So talk to us about how are you guys making sure that, one, you don't lose your North Star when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do you embed it into your talent practices? Yeah, it's a great question, and boy, it really does start with um, accountability, doesn't it? holding our leaders accountable uh, for doing this. Um, I think it was CNBC that uh, Antonio Neri, our CEO, he's Argentinian, did you guys know that? Uh, Antonio was being interviewed about some of the, the, the headwinds, if you will, or challenges, and uh, he said, we're not backing down, right? We're gonna continue to stay focused on DEI. And so one of the things that we do, right, is we have management by objectives, right? We're holding leaders accountable uh, for revenue and sales and gross margin, but we are holding the most senior leaders accountable for driving diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And it's not just about representation, although for sure we strive to ensure, and I know Aisha's here, our chief diversity officer, we strive to ensure that our representation is reflective of our customers, right, as it should be. Uh, are we showing equitable, you know, hiring practices? Are we retaining uh, our uh, diverse talent, and are we developing them? I was talking to someone earlier about we 
hear a lot about attraction and retention, but not enough about development. And so we look at development. We look at promotion parity, right? Are we promoting our diverse talent, uh, our Hispanic talent, as quickly as everyone else, right? And so um, it's that accountability piece that's critical. We think about practices and talent management, uh, like talent reviews and succession planning. So we look at, um, you know, are we identifying who that um, maybe early career, or more senior diverse talent is that we need to pull up? What kinds of programs are we putting in place to do that? Are our succession plans truly diverse? And as we know from the succession readiness program, right, not enough boards today have uh, Hispanic talent, so we need to increase that. It's 5%, so we've got to increase that. Um, so um, these are some of the practices. We're also all about disrupting bias, right? So uh, we've trained our team members in uh, inclusion for all. Uh, we know 98% of our thought is unconscious, right, team? So it's not a surprise there's going to be bias. So what can we do to disrupt that bias, uh, whether it's in the interview process, talent reviews? As a matter of fact, we have a, a new performance management program we call Performance Enablement. We do quarterly snapshots, right, where we talk about how someone's doing in their uh, career uh, aspirations and how we can develop them. And we've put um, pop-ups in, in that process to remind leaders to consider whether they have any bias in their thinking, right? So, um, this is the kind of thing we're trying to do, plus, you know, pushing for innovation. And we know when you have uh, a diverse uh, team member organization, you're going to be more innovative, creative, and collaborative. Awesome. And, you know, some of the things that we're doing at JP Morgan, we, we talked about the Dan when we met, is, you know, how do we embed skills um, development within our programs as well? We want to make sure that our diverse employees are not just developing from a leadership perspective or executive presence, but they have the right skills, the right technology skills. I know we spend the morning talking about AI, and every conference that we go to, that is the main subject. But I love the cybersecurity panel. They spoke about how um, AI is not going to replace humans. Um, and the need that we have in our table, we're talking about the importance of upskilling our generation that is coming up and making sure that no one stays behind and we embed it right into their development, into their learning, into their progression as well. Um, then what are you guys doing here from a skills perspective to make sure that like all boats rise as well? Yeah, you know, that's something I'm so passionate about. I talked to our executive committee about last week. I mean, we, uh, with our announcement of the Juniper acquisition, right, we're looking to be a networking powerhouse. We're looking to be the edge to cloud. Uh, company. Uh, we are an AI powerhouse as well. Um, so we're thinking about what are the capabilities in an organization, the skills required mm -hmm. to excel in those areas. Uh, just the other day, right, Kristen and the executive committee were reflecting on uh, what our strategy is in those areas and, and do we have the talent necessary. Um, and we know we've got so many capable people in the organization where maybe their skills today won't be as relevant in the very near future. So how are they having, to your point, a growth mindset, learning agility to take on new skills? They already know the company. They know our customers. So how can we uh, give them the skills they need? Um, so those are the conversations in these quarterly snapshot, yeah. what we call my success plan discussions, Carlos. That's where we're saying, um, you know, what's your aspiration? What part of the business do you want to be a part of? And how can we help you with those skills? So that's a great point you make. Great point. Awesome. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the struggles that we're having. And I, I, you know, I can attest for that uh, in financial services, but I know that in technology is also a challenge, which is um, we have good representation of Hispanics, let's say particularly at the junior levels, at the early career level. Um, and then as they begin to progress their careers, we continue to see development, but we see a very big drop off when it comes to executives. Um, and, you know, kudos to everyone here that is an executive and you're in the C-suite and you're in executive roles, but when we all look around and we are in meetings, when we are um, in executive boards, sometimes we're the only ones that, that look like ourselves. What, um, what are you guys doing here at HP and, and what are your thoughts about retaining, right, the right um, talent? And then also including and increasing that pipeline so that we can ensure that we will have um, a good farm system, for lack of a better word, coming up through the pipeline so that we can pick them and choose them for different executive roles. Yeah, great questions. You know, we know the importance of uh, getting early career diverse talent, right? So we have all the partnerships that many of you would have with some of the, uh, you know, historically diverse schools and organizations, uh, you know, like high tech. 
And so, you know, one of the first things we do, not a rocket science, is listen, right? We listen through our voice to the workforce uh, surveys. You know, we have a diversity, a DEI index, which talks to us about how well people feel welcomed and included. Uh, we have our resource groups, including Juntos, right, uh, which does a great job. Uh, we, our senior leaders will periodically meet uh, with our resource groups to understand what their lived experiences are and what some of the challenges are there. Uh, and then we do some of the things, a lot of the things that I alluded to earlier. Uh, starting at the top, we have an executive sponsorship program where Antonio Neri sponsored uh, Carlos Quisada, right? And they still meet. I think Carlos was telling me last night to talk about how we can lift up Carlos. And congratulations, Carlos, on your promotion to VP not too long ago. Um, we for sure identify coaching opportunities for specific development needs that our diverse talent has. We do a ton of mentoring. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been talking about AI all day, right? We have uh, something we call Career Hub, right, which is a talent marketplace where AI and ML are helping match uh, our talent with potential mentors, gigs, learning opportunities, and new roles. So we're, uh, the only thing we need to do is make sure it's utilized more, you know, that more people are putting the skills and aspirations that they have in there and, and utilizing it. Um, so these are just a few of the ways, um, and again, continuing these critical partnerships with groups like high tech uh, that, that is so important for folks' development. Awesome. Um, just uh, warning to everyone, we're down to our last two questions, so um, definitely want to hear from the room and what questions you have. So if you do have one, you can um, either raise your hand or go to one of the, the mic stands that we have. But two more questions and topics here to discuss, Dan, before we open it up. Uh, you know, you mentioned about the pie, right, the exposure and the importance of it. Um, and you mentioned about your sponsor program that you have as well. Um, you know, there is a big difference between sponsorship and mentoring. And this is something that we talk about all the time within our spaces. And it's important to be able to delineate the difference between both. Like, the way that we um, define sponsorship is having someone that can speak for you and on your behalf when you're not in the room. So who is that advocate who is doing advocacy for you and speaking about you and saying, yeah, Carlos would be great for that role or for that position or how can we advance him? And then there's mentoring, right? And mentoring can happen outside of the firm. It can happen in another country. It can happen in many different ways. But in order for us to really think about this next generation and bringing them up, two things need to happen. One, they need sponsors. They need advocates. And two, they need mentors as well. Um, and I love the fact of what you guys are doing from an AI ML perspective in regards to the pairing. Um, but for all of us here, it's important that if you don't have sponsors, make sure that, that you go out and build those relationships um, within your organization, within your line of business. But from a mentoring perspective, I think it's so important for all of us to have, I have a platitude of mentors. I have um, work mentors, I have financial mentors, I have a marriage mentor, I have a spiritual mentor, and I think not everybody's a sad subject matter expert, but if I go to these people in different times of my life, they really speak, I give them permission to speak into my life as well. Um, so then how has mentoring impacted your, you know, your personal life and journey? Yeah, you know, gosh, I could give so many stories, but a couple come to mind. Um, I had a mentor uh, back when I was at Honeywell, and uh, I was uh, being offered an opportunity at another company, which um, it was a little bit more money, but at the time it felt like a lot. And I really didn't want to leave Honeywell, but um, I didn't know who to talk to. You know, talking to my boss might have been awkward. So I went to my mentor, and I said, hey, George, um, I've got this opportunity, and this is what it is. He said, Dan, it's not that much money. It's not the right next role for you. Uh, of course, I want you to stay, but um, I think this isn't the right one. And uh, I won't mention the name of the company, but it basically went bankrupt <laughs> not long after uh, the offer. I, I, I turned down the offer, but you know that's the kind of thing uh, the impact mentors can have. I mentioned the one at GE that you know helped me to believe in myself in a way I didn't believe in myself. You talked about on the spiritual and on the personal side. Uh, you know, there was a time in my life where it was all about work. So I was talking with some of you about that yesterday. Uh, and, um, you know, wasn't being the best husband, wasn't, uh, you know, supporting my, my uh, church community the way I should. And I got feedback, you know, from, from mentors about that as well. So they're so critical. The other thing I'll say, 
one of the things we've done, and some of you may have done this, you know, one-to-one -one mentoring can be great, uh, but we were thinking about how we can reach even more of our early career diverse talent. So we put some group mentoring programs in place at HPE where we uh, have, you know, one or two mentors uh, meet with 10 or 12 uh, top talents and, you know, take them through some really good um, leadership and, and, and uh, material and, and talk about our experiences and then have, have them share their experiences. And with some of these programs, like during the program of six to nine months, we saw, you know, 50% plus promotions and new roles and, and post-graduation even more. So, you know, just be thoughtful about some of those kinds of programs you could put in place yeah. in, your, in your company. And I think it's really important for us to, when we think about mentors, uh, think outside of your own type of person. Like, think about somebody different than you. And I mean, even heritage-wise, I'm talking about um, career-wise, um, you know, some of the best mentors are very different than I am. And it's important for us not to just conglomerate amongst ourselves for mentoring. I think we find that, that peer, um, you know, helps us. Advocacy is important. But really think about outside of the box and get yourself mentors and sponsors that, that look different than you, that will give you a different perspective as well. Um, our last question, uh, before we open for Q&A, um, talks about action, right? Uh, we're here, full, uh, a room full of executives and um, aspiring leaders as well. What's in it for us, right? Like, what, what's the call to action for all of us here in the room that as we leave the next few days, what are some things that we need to actually put into, into action? You know, Carlos, you uh, alluded to this with that pie model I talked about. You know, be thinking about, whether it's for yourself or folks you're mentoring and sponsoring, you know, for sure, how can we help them to perform better? How can we help them to live the values that the company needs them to live? But how can we help them to get that exposure and get that networking? Um, think about how you're giving back to the community, right? Are you visible? Are you accessible? Are you, who are you sponsoring? Who are you mentoring? Who are you coaching? And I also think, um, for sure, you know, as we create and add value to our companies, um, this is gonna help elevate. Mm -hmm right, our community. When we're innovative, when we're cutting edge, when we have that uh, hopefully cross-industry experience and that customer, deep customer perspective, it's going to help all of us. So that would be my, uh, my call to action for everybody. Awesome. You know, for me, as we close today, one of the things I definitely take away is the importance of um, giving back, right, and the importance of being grateful for the position that we're placed in, uh, but paying that forward and thinking about not just when you get there and just thinking about yourself, I got here, you know, I, I got to where I wanted to or exceeded my expectations, but look back and let's think about the generation that is coming behind us. And yes, it's gonna require us to um, sacrifice our time and our efforts, but it will be so much worth it because as we get older, as we are, uh, we need to start thinking about legacy, right? Like, what's the legacy we want to leave behind? Like, did we just get to the top and stay there by ourselves or how many people did we bring with us as well? And the last thing I'll say is there's a great book by um, John Maxwell that says, um, everybody communicates, few people connect. And it's one of my favorite books because it talks about, you know, everyone, you know, talks, communicates, expresses themselves. But what we need as true leaders is to connect with people. And in order for us to do that, we need to take time to spend time with people, eat with people, call them, reach out to them, see how they're doing. And that connection truly lasts a lifetime. So even while we're here, uh, another takeaway for us is don't just communicate with people. Don't just exchange a LinkedIn um, account with somebody. Really find a way to connect and stay connected with people because that really transcends um, time and space. So, uh, Dan, thank you so much uh, you. for your time. Big hand for, for Dan and his insights. <laughs> this time we want to definitely open up for some Q&A. Hello, okay, hi. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Christina Mondini, I'm from Salesforce, and uh, I really loved this entire conversation, but something that really spoke to me is when y'all were speaking through how to cultivate psychological safety in your organizations, and one of the uh, examples that Dan had used was talking about uh, a team check-in of sorts, and I'd love to hear more about that model, because it sounds like something I'd like to employ too. Yeah, thank you. I love it. And it's, uh, it's simple, but uh, it's really effective. I mean, again, start your staff meeting, your key team conversation with the personal and the professional check-in, because we often just dive into the, pers uh, the professional. 
without understanding, you know, how someone's bringing their self to work that day. I know I have, with my five kids, some mornings I have a staff meeting first thing, my son didn't take out the garbage like he was supposed to, and I'm really annoyed. Uh, and so I kind of share that with the team, and they can tell, oh, that's why Dan might be a little bit off today. Um, but, you know, it gives the space uh, for people. I, I'll give another example, and I don't know if she's watching. I won't mention her name, but someone on my team, they had a tragedy in their community, you know, last week. Uh, a, a family had a car accident, a, a fatal accident. And um, just giving that space, you know, she was able to share just how tough it had been for her and the community, and we were able to kind of uh, digest that you know, rather than just jumping into the work piece. So I think that's what helps create that, that, that safe environment. Uh, people feel seen, right? It's not just about what they're producing, but who they are as individuals. Um, so I hope that helps expand on it. Thank you. And I, I would just add, like, the importance of just being human. Or, like, we're not, we're not robots, we're not machines, although we work with machines all the time, and, and, but we're human, and you gotta be vulnerable. Right? Like, you gotta be transparent. And what I love about that check-in is like, it's, you open up. We have something at, at, at the bank called Humans at Chase, and it's a PowerPoint, one slide, and they're just pictures of the things that you love to do. And before we talk about business, we talk about anything else, as you're integrating to a new team, just be open, be vulnerable, be yourself. Um, and that creates that environment of people just feeling safe at work. And I would say also, when people make mistakes, don't berate them in public, right? Don't humiliate them. Um, allow people to bring their failures. And, you know, we talk about fail fast and fail forward, but really live it, right? And um, that really allows people to feel comfortable. And I think it's really important for us to create that environment. I had a manager who used to say, uh, we care about the whole person, not just the work person. And it's always stayed with me. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Amanda Ortiz. I'm a software engineer and the DEI champion for my organization at Dell. So um, I've been going through and doing a lot of DEI certifications and trainings, and one thing I've learned is that as employees spend more time in a company, they often become more aware of the disparity between stated DE DEI values and actual practices at executive leadership le uh, level leading to turnover. So how do you suggest addressing this disconnect to ensure that DEI values are not just superficially or performatively promoted, but genuinely practiced and improved upon throughout all levels of organization? Yeah, maybe I can start, Carlos, and, and you can chime in. Uh, one of the things we try to train our leaders to do is to have courageous conversations. Yeah. And when they see that we're not living our values, when, when they see we're not living DEI, to, to call people out on it. Now, to your point, I don't think we should do it in a public space, in a meeting, but if we see someone with, you know, with a microaggression, you know, make sure that we're giving uh, timely coaching you know, uh, in that regard. Uh, I did talk about how we hold our most senior leaders accountable with their MBOs to uh, living DEI, right, whether it's representation or, or equity or inclusion. So, um, I think it's, again, that accountability and having the tough conversations when we need to provide the feedback. And you mentioned that at the beginning, right, in regards to the, the accountability that they have here at HP. We also have it at the firm in which we hold our senior leaders accountable. Uh, but I, I think even more importantly, and, and Dan mentioned it as well, which is the importance of um, incarnating our values and really showing empathy, right, like, genuinely. Right? Not just, I know, when I first started my career, um, a very senior person would see me in the hallways and they would say, hey, Carlos, how are you doing? And before I would answer, they would say, they would say good. Like, it, it didn't matter what I would say. I would say, like, I'm terrible. I don't feel good. He would say good. So he didn't really care about how I was doing. He just wanted to ask me. And sometimes we do the same thing with people. Like, we ask, like, how are you doing? And we just move on to the next thing. Um, so showing up, like, real honestly and empathetically is really important. And then that level of accountability at the C-suite is really important. Thank you. Hello, hello. How are you doing, Carlos? Good. Good. Um, so. <laughs> you see, that just made me feel, I went back in time 30 years. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Gina Cano, and uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, so you can get your 10 connections. I can be one of them. You'll find me on LinkedIn. So uh, my question is, I'm the, I work for Dell, and I'm one of the executive sponsors for our development pillar under our ERG Latino Connection. And we've been exploring development programs that are specific to Hispanic and Latinos needs. 
do you believe that there is a, a requirement to have tailored approaches towards this community, or does a one-size-fit-all apply? Yeah, that's a, a tough question. I mean, I think there are some principles of development that apply to everyone, right? I mean, I mentioned one of them. There are many, the 70-20-10 you know, rule of development. But then I think each community has its own unique challenges and opportunities, and that's why the resource groups are so critical, right? We don't just do listening sessions for all the RGs together, right? We listen to them uh, individually, and, uh, and we get different insights, right? Different RGs have different challenges. We were with our um, you know, disabilities RG last week, and uh, again, uh, accessibility and some of the challenges we see there are different. Uh, so, um, so I think, um, and at the end of the day, every individual should have their own development plan, right? So not only should the community be thinking about development for, for Hispanics, but for individuals, what does that look like specifically? And, you know, in, in the new landscape that we're in, a, a lot of companies are shying away from tailored, customized, we want to be more inclusive. And, of course, we're doing that body of work at the firm, and I imagine that other companies, HP is as well, just to safeguard the organization. But we're, we're trying to be led by objectively by what the, what statistics are telling us in regards to our demographics. And I, I mentioned before about the fall off, right, from one level to another, right, from that junior level, middle level to the executive level. So when we look at that, we say we need to do something to be able to boost that, you know, this population into these new roles. And one way of doing it is definitely having inclusive, you know, development plans for everybody, but we want to focus on specific targeted principal audiences where we can help them. And, then we also get information from our like employee opinion surveys. And overwhelmingly, what employees that are Hispanic or people of color, what they tell us consistently is that they want more opportunity to have sponsors and to have mentors, and that they don't have the same network that perhaps other populations have. So we have to create those environments where it's more organic and it's not disingenuous and it's not uncomfortable to go ask someone, hey, would you be my mentor or would you be my sponsor? So we want to create these platforms where we create that connectivity without making any promises. It doesn't mean that you're going to get promoted. It doesn't mean that you're going to advance. But it's going to give you, and this is what I tell my, my CIOs all the time, we're looking for the same opportunity. We just, that's what equity is. Equity is creating the same opportunity for everyone. So how do we create that platform and that equal leverage so that from there on, it's about meritocracy? And I tell them, I said, put us anywhere and we will shine. I, we don't need favors. We don't need shortcuts. We don't need anything special. We just want the opportunity. So we have to create that opportunity and building that equity as well. Perfect. Well, thank you all for your time, and it's been a great privilege to spend uh, this hour with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.